Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's 7 p.m. Um, welcome to another episode of Colorectal Surgery Virtual Educational Series. We are very happy to have Dr. Karim Alavi with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Alavi is the Program Director of Colorectal Fellowship mm -hmm. at UMass. Um, he is uh, an Assistant Professor of Surgery in the Department of Surgery. He received his medical degree from George Washington University and did uh, his uh, general surgery residency in Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C. After this training, he completed his colorectal surgery fellowship at University of Minnesota. Dr. Alavi worked uh, at University of Minnesota as a staff surgeon before he moved to UMass. He also completed a master's in public health at Harvard University. He's Hello, an Maria. clinician and an educator. He also um, is an active participant on multiple surgical societies, including uh, American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons, and currently serves on the program committee for uh, Association for um, Academic Surgery and APDCRS. He's a reviewer in multiple journals, and he gave multiple presentations at uh, national me meetings. And Dr. Alavi, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about operating in difficult pelvis. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Oops, sorry. Uh, so thanks for inviting me to give this uh, uh, talk on operating on the difficult pelvis. Um, so uh, these are my disclosures. Um, so um, the objectives for this talk are really to discuss some of the challenges of uh, pelvic anatomy, uh, to briefly review the TME principles with regards to rectal cancer, since the majority of the time that you're gonna be in the pelvis um, when, you, when it's going to be difficult and challenging is more often than not um, when you're operating on a cancer or recurrent cancer. Um, I'm gonna discuss briefly some of the challenges with TME uh, and then really get into what uh, the definition of a difficult pelvis is. Uh, trying to see if there's ways we can predict who is going to have a difficult pelvis so you can be prepared uh, from a surgical standpoint. <clears throat> and then I'll discuss some of the management of uh, particularly the distal pelvis uh, operatively. Uh, and then discuss, uh, you know, just briefly some potential future directions. And, you know, this is, uh, if there are any questions, please interrupt me. Um, I don't want to hear myself talk for an entire hour. Uh, this isn't going to be an hour, but uh, nonetheless. So if there's questions, feel free to interrupt. So the pelvis. Um, so as many of you uh, guys know, your fellows or just the recently graduated fellows or junior faculty, um, it's a fixed anatomy. And that fixed anatomy poses uh, significant technical challenges. Um, it has depth, there's angulation, and there's limited visualization, all of which uh, increase difficulty. Uh, and there are, uh, this can lead to very pelvic specific types of complications, which can, can be catastrophic. There can be bladder urethral injury uh, or bleeding from the presacral venous plexus, uh, which will, would require significant transfusions and uh, extraordinary measures to try and get the uh, bleeding to stop uh, or bleeding from the iliac vessels. Of course, autonomic nerve injury uh, and the uh, implications of that are well known with uh, both bladder and sexual dysfunction. And then obviously the more difficult the pelvis, the longer the operative times. So the treatment of rectal cancer uh, goes back um, a, a long time ago, but really the, it was first documented and reported by Dr. Ernst, Ernst Miles Ernest Miles uh, back in 1908 in Lancet, where he described it as the method of performing an abdominal perineal excision for carcinoma of the rectum and of the terminal portion of the pelvic colon. So again, you guys um, know this or hopefully or have been exposed to it at least through the first part of your fellowship, but these are the TME principles, uh, total excision of the mesorectum or tumor-specific mesorectal excision if the tumor is slightly higher in the rectum, direct visualization, sharp dissection in an avascular or holy plane as Dr. Heal described it, preserving the mesorectal envelope and avoiding tumor spillage, thus reducing chances for recurrence, 
nerve preservation for um, uh, avoidance of bladder and sexual dysfunction, and sphincter preservation when possible and feasible, um, and based on both tumor and patient characteristics. So what are the, some of the challenges with TME with regards to pelvic anatomy? So there's certain factors that complicate resections, visceral obesity, uh, narrow pelvis, uh, patients who've received preoperative chemoradiation. Um, the goal of preserving autonomic uh, nerve uh, uh, and thus sexual and bladder function can obviously complicate resection. And then sphincter preservation uh, or, the, or attempting or with the goal being of sphincter preservation, that can sometimes impact or it provide challenges uh, to uh, pelvic surgery. So overall, it's been reported the incidence of incomplete TME ranges anywhere from 10 to 15%, and the incidence uh, is directly correlated with the size of the tumor, uh, as well as location of the tumor with regards to the anal verge. Um, so, uh, and, and this will uh, become obviously more, more, um, important during later portions of this talk. So again, many of you know that the treatment of curable locally advanced stage two or three uh, rectal cancer relies on surgical resection as the core feature of a multimodal treatment process. So surgical resection is really the most important modality for rectal cancer in terms of cure, prognosis, staging, and therapeutic decision-making. In that regard, specimen integrity and tumor uh, pathologic staging directly correlate with recurrence, and tumor TME completeness um, uh, is a surrogate for both good technique and the likelihood of recurrence. So just a brief review uh, of uh, two uh, pretty significant studies that were published recently. Uh, I guess it's not, it's, it's not so recent, it's 2015. Looking at laparoscopy and TME, the a la carte study and the ECOSOX Z6051 study. I'm sure, both of you, uh, I mean, all of you know this, but I'm just going to review both of these just briefly. They were both uh, comparing laparoscopic to open resection um, in a non inferior, uh, inferior study design. Uh, it's a, they, they were both randomized phase three uh, trials, multi center open versus laparoscopic. The a la carte primary endpoint was composite oncologic surrogates indicating an adequate resection. So completeness of TME, circumferential resection margin greater than one millimeter, greater than or equal to one millimeter, and clear distal margin greater than or equal to one millimeter. Uh, primary endpoint for the ECOSOG trial was also sort of a composite pathologic endpoint of TME completeness, uh, negative distal and circumferential margin. The inferiority margin for ACOSOG was 6%, whereas for the a la carte was 8%. <laughs> and when you look at when you uh, look at it in that regard, um, the the uh, for both of these uh, studies with regards to um, CRN distal uh, margin TME completeness uh, and what's considered a successful re resection, uh, non inferiority of lab compared to open was not established for either study. Now. Um, these studies did not include robotic approaches. These studies did not include TATME approaches. <clears throat> so that, that needs to be considered when, when these studies were quoted. But there's, um, this brings up what defines a difficult pelvis. And really, um, it's, it's multiple factors, but I, I try to uh, uh, place them in different bins. There's patient factors, sur surgeon factors, and equipment slash hospital factors um, that are involved. So small pelvic volume, a longer pelvis, uh, a more curved sacrum, a more acute anorectal angle, obviously reoperative pelvic surgery, uh, having an ex experienced assistant and having the necessary equipment uh, is critical. Uh, Clearly, the surgeon experience is uh, of paramount importance, uh, and um, the size of the tumor and the, and the size of the mesorectal fat all come into play when uh, you consider um, or you start thinking about or differentiating between what's difficult and what's an easy pelvis. 
So there are several pelvic subtypes, um, and we've all encountered pelvises that are the gynecoid pelvis. Nice, wide, open, easy pelvis. Uh, feel really good about ourselves because the dissection is pretty easy. It's a very shallow pelvis, um, and uh, uh, that's easily managed versus an android pelvis. So where it's a longer sacrum, um, it's a much narrower suprapubic arch compared to the gynecoid pelvis. Um, and um, again, the, uh, the width uh, between ischial spines is much narrower. Um, and sometimes you add to that uh, the uh, rather increased curvature of the sacrum in some patient, then that adds an additional layer of complexity uh, and here you have packed in all these uh, organs that you're trying to avoid and you're trying to dissect between them to try and resect um, a rectum. So that uh, just in and of itself, the size of the bony pelvis can add an ex a, a significant amount of uh, uh, complexity to any dissection and make it uh, difficult. So are there ways of predicting what a difficult pelvis is? Well, that's where imaging comes into play, uh, even though uh, we're not there yet to, to have perfect predictors or risk index indices that uh, can predict um, a difficult pelvis so that uh, the surgeon can prepare for it. But there have been a few studies. Um, this study at, uh, that was uh, published uh, in 2018, and there was a follow-up study uh, validating these this risk index. Uh, this was uh, done by a Tom Reese group out of University of Florida, where they tried to develop <clears throat> a preoperative assessment tool to oops sorry uh, to predict difficult uh, pelvic dissections. And uh, they um, this was a retrospective study uh, with patients undergoing either low anterior resection or abdominal perineal resection for rectal cancer. Within, with, uh, for cancers that were within 10 centimeters of the anal verge, they, they accumulated about 14 different measurements, including um, that would go into linear uh, dimensions, volumetric dimensions, anorectal angle, and sacrococcygeal curve uh, dimensions. And what they discovered, as expected, that the male gender is, is um, uh, significantly correlated with what's considered a difficult pelvis, pelvic radiation, Distance is as well uh, associated. Distance from the promontory to the pelvic floor, if it's greater than 13 centimeters, is associated uh, with um, uh, a difficult pervis, uh, pelvis. And um, the model was subsequently va validated in an independent data set. And then subsequently, a follow up study uh, was done as well on a separate cohort. And they. Um, Really, it boils down to what a difficult pelvis is. There are certain predictors of what a difficult pelvis might be or what might what you might encounter during an operation. And it's the inlet, the pelvic inlet being narrow, as well as the mid pelvis being narrow. The um, um, soft tissue volume, so increased soft tissue volumes, uh, can potentially obviously add and add to the extra layer of difficulty in in mobilizing the rectum. A deep pelvis uh, um, where it's not only deep, but there's also an extreme curve to the sacrum can add uh, to, the, to the complexity and the difficulty. And a more acute anorectal angle. Uh, so that's the when you're trying to get that distal third of the rectum immobilized, that's where the challenges uh, um, are encountered. And you know, t that's that, those particular studies looked at CAT scans, and I think I, I suspect it's because um, the time uh, when those patients were were enrolled in that study, MRI had still hadn't taken the foothold in terms of its uh, uh, critical importance in tumor staging. Uh, but it is clearly important in terms of staging, uh, but also uh, in terms of surgical uh, planning. And there have been several studies that have looked at what uh, dimensions can potentially uh, um, impact or, or increase uh, the difficulty and therefore potentially risk um, uh, recurrences. Uh, so for example, in narrow interspinous distance, as pictured here, 
um, were, was shown in these studies to be associated with increased um, CRM positivity, incomplete TME, and increased conversion uh, to open. Um, but it's not just the bony pelvis uh, that is the issue. It's the pelvic soft tissue and the degree of it and the amount of it, which may also predict surgical difficulty. So large mesenteric fat areas have been shown by some studies, uh, MFA, uh, is associated uh, with increased pelvic dissection time and increased surgical dif difficulty uh, based on uh, the observed of their observed uh, measurement uh, parameters. So, what are some of the solutions or options? I wish I had um, a solution for uh, one answer that could um, uh, fit all patients, but uh, we know that's not the case. Each patient is different. Uh, each tumor is different, um, and uh, surgeon skills are also uh, an important factor here. But I've just listed here some of the options that are available uh, to surgeons. Um, um, so, uh, you know, it's really important uh, to have as many of these in your uh, armamentarium as possible. Uh, obviously, some uh, require more, more skill, exposure, and training and have a steeper learning curve than others. And I've thrown in here local excisions as well because there are certain tumors that um, are more amenable to local excision, particularly if you uh, um, take into account patient factors, you know, patients with significant comorbidities um, uh, that would preclude them undergoing a significant resection um, that um, um, would uh, be extremely not only challenging, but also difficult for, from a recovery standpoint, then some of these other options may be suitable in those specific cases. So my, my first advice to, to you is to A, get a good night's sleep, uh, which uh, sometimes is challenging in and of itself if you have uh, little ones that wake you up in the middle of the night. And also, uh, to get a good breakfast uh, in the morning. Uh, usually, I um, if I know I, I have a difficult case, that's going to be the first case. It's not going to be the second case. It's not going to follow another case um, because you need to be uh, uh, at the top of your game uh, if you're um, expecting any sort of uh, difficulty in a pelvis. So this quote I truly believe in, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Uh, and um, it's extremely critical, particularly, again, I'm, I'm really um, just trying to focus on the difficult pelvis. So whether it's a redo anastomosis um, or a recurrence at an anastomosis, a failed anastomosis that requires resection and re-anastomosis, or um, a rectal cancer that requires a resection, but it's in a difficult pelvis. So I think in my mind, all of those sort of fall into the same bucket. I mean, there may be sub subgroups that need a little different type of attention, but for the most part, um, those to me uh, are, I identify as a difficult, potentially difficult pelvis. So for evaluation of a tumor or let's say an anastomosis that needs to be revised, redone or resected, it's really, critical to get a good sense of uh, where that is in relation to the anal verge uh, and in relation to the anal, anal rectal ring. It really is critical. Um, and especially for a tumor, it's very different if it's a posterior tumor as opposed to an anterior tumor in a male with a narrow pelvis. Um, so those are opposed different challenges, uh, especially if they've received neoadjuvant uh, chemo radiation. Imaging is critical, MRI, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, I look at images and I don't just look at one view, I look at multiple views because it's critical to, uh, to sort of get a sense of the, the tumor and get a three-dimensional view of the tumor. Uh, the, CAT, the CAT scan is also critical because uh, while it, it may give you, it won't give you the details or the details of the pelvis as much as let's say an MRI would, uh, the it does give you an idea of the length of the colon that you're dealing with and suitability or, or, or the need to do any further mobilization or proximal mobil mobilization like the splenic flexure. If you're preparing for an open case, obviously deep pelvic instruments are essential. If you don't have these at your hospital, 
uh, wherever you end up um, training or where you are training, then you should not be doing a deep pelvic dissection. Um, lighted St. Mark's retractor, and there are different sizes of those, Wiley renal vein retractors that, that are really critical in terms of the mobilization laterally, as well as anteriorly in a very narrow pelvis. Um, long metal suction, um, and long monopolar cautery with extension uh, so that uh, you're not, you can see what you're doing without uh, getting your head and hands in the way. A headlight is critical um, and urethral stents uh, or uh, even fluorescence imaging of the ureters, uh, depending on if you're doing this robotically or laparoscopically. Um, these I, I don't typically do in a uh, just a standard pelvic dissection, even if it's going to be a difficult case. But I do, um, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty standard uh, for me to have these inserted in any sort of a redo pelvic operation. Um, that is standard because it's going to be very challenging to identify the ureters um, uh, uh, as you're dissecting, especially if you're having very, a lot of difficulties in visualizing what you're doing in a very narrow narrow pelvis. And then finally, you know, getting help from colleagues, senior partners. It's not, um, it's not a failure to ask for help. And I wouldn't, you know, the, the, the worst thing in my mind is if you go in, you're unprepared and you don't have anyone um, um, sort of tagged to help you. Uh, because, you know, everyone is busy. And if I know I'm help helping a partner, I keep my schedule light uh, or I make sure that I'm uh, in the vicinity so I can come and help them uh, if uh, when they need it. Uh, and especially for a, TA a case like a TATME, you do need another co-surgeon more often than not to help with that. Having senior resident help is a, uh, or a fellow, such as uh, uh, those of you on the call, is extremely important uh, because just to drive the camera, um, uh, have another instrument to help with the retraction. If you're doing it robotically and you're having difficulties with that distal third of the rectum uh, in a very bulk, uh, in a patient who's uh, obese with a bulky uh, mesorectum and a narrow pelvis, it's sometimes helpful to have someone that helps with the suctioning as well as with the retraction of some of the uh, pelvic tissue for to allow for visualization. And it's, it's very important to have that uh, assistant um, available. So as I mentioned, the MRI for me is extremely important and it's not just one um, um, view that's important. It's, I look at three uh, major views. I look at the axial views because that gives me a sense of how wide the pelvis is, also relationship of, of the mesorectum to a vital structures anteriorly. This particular patient was over close to about 400 pounds. Um, the, uh, and obviously with a, a posterior uh, uh, rectal lesion, uh, post chemo radiation, post TNT. So um, I look at the sagittal view because obviously that gives an, a, a sense of uh, the, the relationship of the the distal edge of the tumor to the top of the sphincter complex. It also gives me an idea of uh, if I'm if I'm going to approach this via TATME of how much I have to dive and go uh, posteriorly to be able to get uh, to be able to uh, get around the mesorectum and therefore not go through the mesorectum. Again, this is not a talk about TATME, but that's just the way I approach it. Um, uh, I also look at the axial oblique views uh, because, again, that gives me a better view of the tumor. Um, the Again, the width of the pelvis, its relationship to the anterior structures. Uh, for anterior tumors, it also is, it gives a good sense of um, uh, involvement of any of, in, particularly in, in a male, uh, uh, involvement of the prostate, uh, uh, seminal vesicles, and so forth. So. Now, in some cases, um, that axial oblique view can give you even information about the tumor response, because if I had only looked at both of these views here and here, I would have missed the fact that really this tumor, there's some puckering here at the CRM, which uh, I have to account for as I'm doing the resection. So again, this all kind of goes back to um, surgical planning, uh, right? I mean, we're 
um, operating in the pelvis with a lot of very important vital structures. Um, sometimes you're millimeters away from injury to the presacral plexus that can cause significant bleeding uh, or to uh, other important structures, iliac vein and so forth. So you, you really need to get a good sense of the anatomy in that particular patient um, before you really uh, tackle these cases. So now whether you approach it via open uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, or robotic or TATME, um, the difficulty really lies uh, as you get below the perineal re reflection, particularly, uh, especially in a narrow, in a, in a very difficult and challenging pelvis. Uh, the difficulty becomes an exposure, retraction, smoke, having a good smoke evacuator, having an air seal or a good smoke evacuator is essential. Rectal division, uh, obviously, is, is a challenge, uh, even with the robot, because uh, it's not uncommon that you either have to come top down to divide the rectum or you have to use multiple staple fires. Uh, with crossing staple lines um, to be able to um, get a good rectal division as the as the larger staples, particularly in the narrow narrow pelvis, are going to be challenging to get a, uh, to get a good division, a good um, um, uh, division uh, that's that's uh, coming perpendicular to the rectum as opposed to tangentially. Uh, and astemosis in the deep pelvis, particularly in the deep narrow pelvis, can be challenging, especially if you don't have an experienced assistant helping you with both the camera as well as retraction. So, in my mind, that's where, again, having uh, options really helps um, when it comes to really the distal third of the pelvis. And uh, really, TATME has changed how we approach things um, and the ability to tackle these that portion of the pelvis which I call sort of no man's land particularly in the um, in the very narrow pelvises or the difficult pelvises so uh, TATME does give you that opportunity to get below the tumor transected or below the anastomosis that let's say has failed and divide it and know that you're going to be um, having a good margin all the way around. Now, having said that, it is uh, does come uh, at a cost of a very steep learning curve. And there are some new complications that have been encountered in doing this uh, approach. Um, but it's not uncommon that um, if I know I'm doing a very difficult pelvic operation, even if it's open from above, and let's say a male with a very narrow pelvis uh, that I would uh, have the, um, I would even approach this as an open case from above, but to be able to transect it and to be able to remove the rectum um, um, uh, to complete that portion of the operation, the distal third of the operation, then go down below and perform a TATME. So that is not uh, an unusual approach as well. So it is a it is really a new perspective. Um, you're kind of doing everything in reverse, but you're using some of the foundational skills that you've already learned uh, in you know many years of residency and now fellowship. Things that you use this, uh, these skills for are things like TEM and TAMIS, obviously in laparoscopy. Um, you know, perineal approaches to any sort of a, uh, or any sort of a, a any a type of a dis dissection that's from a perineal approach, such as an Altmeyer or even a transanal um, uh, uh, resection of a polyp. Uh, and then, you know, as you, um, as you do your fellowship and you become more comfortable, you um, learn how to do um, hand-sewn anastomosis techniques and really low pelvic anastomotic techniques as well. So, um, this particular approach is a is a really I consider the T uh, is a team team sport uh, because you do need that individual from above to help you complete the dis dissection uh, and um, um, disconnect uh, all the attachments so you can extract the specimen either transanally or in the uh, in the suprapubic uh, position. Now, having said that, there's there's uh, some newer and what what 
um, something like a TATME does or has done, it has really allowed us to um, sort of learn how to use newer equipment. Uh, and that, those, uh, that type of equipment can be applied to an abdominal approach, not necessarily a TATME. Uh, but with regards to just a transanal approach, obviously there's um, the transanal access channels uh, that are available, the rigid uh, platforms, and particularly the Wolf platform um, that is available. I believe the Stores platform is no longer available. Um, and uh, the insufflation that is critical, that has been critical for success in TATME has been an air seal. But if you're not going to do a uh, TATME and uh, you're going to approach this from above, particularly a tough pelvis that you're going to approach uh, using uh, laparoscopy or robotically, an air seal can be inserted transabdominally, and that helps really does help with the smoke evacuation uh, uh, that can and the fog that can build up uh, and the moisture that can build up, particularly in someone with a very deep narrow pelvis. Um, where you're really making millimeter uh, movements uh, to be able to dissect the uh, rectum and, and, and remove it. But just like with any procedures, there are some new worries with the TATME. Obviously entering and staying in the holy TME plane is critical uh, and can be challenging. Um, and there are other concerns such as uh, um, injury to the nerves. Uh, the ureters are actually located superior and lateral. Not you're not looking down on them. You're going to be approaching them, coming from above, coming from below, and and therefore they can get injured if if not careful. And obviously in males, there's a concern of uh, injury to the urethra and the prostate. So, but the goal is to have this nice uh, specimen, um, and with the TATM, yes, I mentioned. Uh, because you're coming at it in reverse fashion, there is a there is a risk of getting intra mesorectal like this, um, and uh, not not staying in that nice holy plane. Uh, because the CO2 can play tricks on you, and uh, give you the impression that you are in that in that plane where in reality you are not. So, what are some oncologic outcomes when it comes to TATME? There's um, uh, we published our series in 2022, uh, looking at 79 patients with mid to low uh, rectal cancers over a five-year period um, with a mean, median BMI of 28 and a median follow-up of, of uh, nearly 30 months uh, with a um, composite optimal pathology. Uh, again, this is sort of based off of what was uh, published uh, with the a la carte and the um, uh, ACASOG trial of 95%. Uh, there were no local recurrences, and we still have not had any local recurrences uh, with 13% uh, systemic recurrence, which is on par with what's been published uh, in other trials, and a two-year disease-specific um, uh, survival and overall survival of 91% and 94%, respectively. And this was uh, followed up by the multi-center phase two trial that was just recently published by Pat Silla, which we were a part of. It was mainly North American high volume centers, uh, Canada and the US. Uh, they recruited 100 patients, 70% 70, 70 of which were, were male. So these were, as you can imagine, difficult pelvises with low rectal cancers with a median height of six centimeters uh, from the anal verge and about 70% received a neoadjuvant treatment, 54% were hand-sewn, and there were 18% uh, in asthmatic complications, but 98% stoma closure rate uh, with a complete or near complete TME of 90% 90, 90 and a positive margin. Uh, only two had positive margins. Uh, there were two conversions to, um, um, in, in the abdominal uh, portion, one, uh, um, or yeah, one transanal. So uh, in terms of their post-op, uh, there were 8% um, complications, again, two vaginal, one urethral injury, 30-day um, morbidity of 49%, um, uh, with uh, there were a total of 71 complications with the clavian dindo uh, greater than three of 28.6. And at 90 day, there was a 56% uh, complication rate. Overall, um, it, it, it was felt that TATME is safe. Um, 
but it has to be done in 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 a in a center that's experienced because uh, there are a lot of things that can potentially go go wrong and um, again, this is I don't I don't want this to be a TATME talk, but I think it's relevant when it's being you're discussing a, a, a difficult uh, pelvis. One of these uh, potential risks is urethral injury, and that's a very real uh, uh, risk. Uh, CO2 embolism has been uh, documented, and it's actually been reported on uh, in another study, um, not only by us by uh, by a collaborative as well. And then incorrect. Whoops. Incorrect uh, plane of surgeries, uh, which uh, can impact oncologic outcomes, bleeding, uh, injury to adjacent adjacent structures, nerves, uh, the vagina, bladder, and um, um, of course, we still don't know long term what the impact is going to be on anastomotic leak rates if this does um, uh, or is used by more and more surgeons. Um, so what about um, the future of pelvic surgery? I, I truly believe that this is where this is headed. Um, uh, I think uh, augmented reality surgery, augmented reality um, um, equipment um, is extremely, uh, is going to become pivotal in pelvic uh, surgery. And, and if you think about it, it's, it's, um, it's uh, kind of surprising that it hasn't yet. Um, and there's not much a more emphasis in um, having this come to the forefront. Um, but this is just an example uh, of a study that was just recently published. Uh, this is a 3D reconstruction of a CAT scan, and then um, it's onlaid, and then the, the surgeon has a headset on and can see, uh, although again, this is um, early generation, so the um, quality is going to hopefully be much better, but um, uh, this is how uh, where the where I think this could be headed, and where where it becomes critical uh, in dealing with patients with complex uh, pelvises. Uh, that's uh, uh, I think the next um, next level um, that needs to be achieved. So <clears throat> I think we still have plenty of time for discussion after this, but um, it's really critical to be able to understand pelvic anatomy because uh, of how, uh, what it, uh, it's um, important in being able, especially when you're operating in, in a very difficult pelvis. Uh, the MRI at this point, uh, spe specifically a, a rectal protocol MRI, uh, plays a very significant role in preoperative preparation for surgery. Uh, and again, I, I, I find it critical to review all of the, the views uh, prior to surgery. Be prepared for all approaches, even open or TATME, if you have the experience, but if you don't, that's fine. Um, having experienced help uh, is critical uh, because um, uh, the worst thing to, it, 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 the worst thing a thing possible is to operate in a very difficult pelvis with an inexperienced assistant um, that really makes uh, for a very long case. And then, uh, as I mentioned, again, augmented reality will add another dimension and, and hopefully enhance what we're currently doing and how we're uh, approaching uh, difficult pelvises. All right, with uh, that, I'm going to conclude. Again, thank you for the invite to talk. Hopefully this was helpful and um, I'm happy to take any questions. This was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Alavi. Um, I have one question. Uh, Dr. Avery Walker asked, what findings on pre-op imaging would tell you that this pelvis is too difficult to proceed with surgery? Well, I don't think, uh, I don't think um, you're not going to proceed with surgery. I guess if the, there is no other option, you sort of have to have to just plan for it. I think the imaging is going to help you prepare for it. So, for example, if uh, again, when you're looking at the, at the axial views and the um, axial oblique cuts, um, the mesenteric fat is um, large. There, the the intraspinous space, intertubercular uh, uh, spaces are narrow. Um, then, um, uh, then I think that would uh, prompt me to be prepared. So, 
And how would I be prepared? I would um, ensure that I've help, um, especially if it's a distal tumor, uh, and especially if they've had radiation uh, treatment. Um, normally for something like that, I would probably do it in a TATME fashion. Again, that's, that's how we approach it here at UMass. So I would have help. I would have another, I would have another experienced surgeon up top, but if you don't, uh, then I would be prepared to be, uh, to do as much as I can, either robotically and laparoscopically, but be prepared to, um, uh, when you are unable to get beyond a certain level to, um, to approach it open. But again, you need to have those open instruments available. Um, those instruments that you normally use for open cases, how we used to do it before robotics and laparoscopy became, um, became the go-to, um, to be able to approach it in those cases. I mean, um, uh, and then there, there, the final uh, factor is, you know, is this, if you don't have those capabilities, if you don't have those instruments, if you don't feel you're comfortable with it and you don't have assistance to help you, then those are the cases that you may want to think about potentially referring out. I mean, no one wants to do that, um, of course, but, um, but you know, that, you know, it doesn't take um, much for things to go wrong. And, and we've all seen uh, recurrent cancers um, um, uh, referred to us from surgeries that have gone awry, right? I mean, if a uh, stapler coming across a, a tumor, um, tumor spillage, uh, rupture of the rectum during resection, all of that stuff. So it's best to be, be prepared as much as you can. And if there is at all any question or concern that you may not be able to approach it in that fashion, then, then at that time, refer um, if, if you are unable to. Again, it's not a failure. If that's it's it's actually shows wise uh, clinical judgment. So definitely, uh, Dr. Susie Hill is asking with the caveat that tattooing can often make dissection more challenging to visualize the planes. If someone is coming to you without a prior tattoo, do you personally tattoo if you're planning to do an LAR? No. <laughs> So um, yes, the tattooing, no matter you know, it, no matter how careful you are uh, in terms of how much you put and not put, uh, it does tend to um, sort of work itself across uh, the potential area of the of transection, especially if you're concerned that it's a narrow pelvis, it's a mid to low lesion, and you're gonna you're not gonna have much space. So um, you know, the, the um, that's why intraoperatively, uh, it's important to have, you know, uh, some sort of an endoscopic evaluation tool so you can assess, especially if there's been significant response and you're not going to be able to feel where the tumor is, uh, if you're doing it robotically or, or laparoscopically, then that uh, there are ways endoscopically that you can assess exactly where you're going to where you're going to transect and and then and then transect. Now that's a different. It's not as you know. I don't worry about it as much for the mid to mid rectal tumors and lower rectal tumors uh, because I would approach those via TATME. Um, again, that's just us. But in that case, I know exactly where I'm going to transect, so it doesn't matter if it's tattooed or not because I can see where the lesion is. So. But to answer long-winded answer to your question, Susie, you, no, I would prefer not tattoo. Great. Um, we have a um, question from Sir John. Dr. Ahmed Alavi is asking, how do you decide which approach uh, to proceed with robotic, laparoscopic versus open in your practice? Uh, in our practice, uh, I prefer, so um, again, this is just us. Again, shouldn't doesn't apply to everyone, but this is me and most of my partners. If it's a rectal sigmoid upper rectal cancer, then I would do it robotically. Um, if I have robot time, if I don't, then it would be laparoscopic. Um, any mid rectal or lower rectal, uh, then it's TATME. And then open. Um, I've I've sort of um, you know for for morbidly obese patients. Um, I'd give it a try 
uh, robotically or laparoscopically, but I'd have a very low threshold of opening. You know, sometimes I know it's taboo these days. Uh, and some patients, you just need to get your hands in there and get better exposure. So, uh, and, you know, an obese patient with a very heavy rectum, um, especially if they have a lot of comorbidities, if they have a very fat mesorectum, making, making the dissection, the presacral plane extremely difficult. Um, you know, you can spend eight, nine hours on a robot trying to dissect that for a midrectal cancer uh, or um, not and do it open and um, with, poten you know, uh, with potentially saving a lot of uh, hours in the OR in the lithotomy position and, and uh, probably in trend Do you use any saprofilm? Uh, to prevent like difficult pelvis subsequent in subsequent surgeries and in any cases? You mean putting the separate film in the pelvis? Uh, using separate film before closing, not in the pelvis, but... Um... Okay. No, no. I mean, because again, most of those, most of what we do is now, you know, either robotic or TATME, laparoscopic, and the incisions are so small that no, um, rarely do it. I, in open cases, yes. In open cases... In redo cases, yes, but uh, again, I, I wouldn't lay it on an anastomosis as long as there's momentum or or some layer between the separate film and the anastomosis, then yes, uh, but but um, but not in just the standard, you know, case. Even if it's a difficult pelvis, I wouldn't use separate separate film. And I have one more question. Um, when you are actually explaining and communicating with the patients that you would maybe qualify for having a difficult pelvis, do you have like any certain um, highlights that, or you want to make sure that they understand? Because um, I think sometimes communicating and using this very medical terms kind of scare the patients and mm -hmm. um, it can cause some trust problems with the surgeons too. So I would love to hear if you have any tips for us. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, in any patient that I'm going to do a pelvic operation on, I review the, you know, standard speech, you know, potential injury to nurse, potential injury to um, uh, to uh, the presacral plexus, and so on and so forth. So that that's that's included for everyone. Now there are certain patients, um, and again, it's it's patient specific and it's tumor specific. Um, and patient specific, both from a um, education understanding standpoint, literacy standpoint, but also from their um, you know body habitus um, standpoint. So you know, in someone who has, uh, let's say a, let's say the the one MRI I showed that uh, where that guy was about four hundred pounds, I have a real discussion with them. Uh, about the possibility of not being able to do an, uh, an anastomosis um, because, uh, because of, um, you know, if you look at his MRI, very narrow pelvis, very bulky mesorectum. Uh, and then you worry about what his colon is going to be like and whether it would even fit in his pelvis. So I have, the, I, I, that's, a, that's someone that I have that discussion with. So it's very important to like be aware of the tumor and the um, characteristics of the tumor in relation to um, the other structures. For example, I, uh, if you have a anterior low tumor uh, that is abutting the prostate and or the prosthetic urethra, then I have a different discussion with them about the possibility of, of injury to the urethra, if they've had radiation, the potential for the repair not, not holding, so, I mean, you, you, I, I think if you have that, those, that open discussion with the patients and you obviously have to, have to um, couch the discussion um, to, the, to their level of understanding, right? So you can't just have this type of a high level discussion with a patient because they're not gonna get it. It's just gonna go right over their head. But, um, you know, uh, bringing it down to their level, but then also making it specific for that particular patient based on um, what you saw from when you uh, scoped the patient from the MRI uh, and then 
the patient habitus and co comorbidities and risk factors and so on and so forth. So a lot of factors go into it, and I try to tailor it based on based on those things. Uh, does that does that answer your question, or did I go off on it? No, that's perfect. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, I think we answered all the questions. Thank you so much for um, the lecture, Dr. Alavi. It was a pleasure listening to you, and thanks everyone for tuning in here and Sir John. Um, have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks for the invite.